He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. And we are live. We are recording. All right. Well, folks, welcome. This is the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast with Dr. Philip Ovedia, America's favorite ex-obese heart surgeon, uh, who's kind of turned into what we call a rebel MD. If you've listened to him any time at all, you know why considered a rebel. So we've got with us today a guy who, frankly, as I look at his website and uh, scrolled your Instagram feed, gave me hope, inspired me, that just because I've got a particular number of candles on my birthday cake doesn't mean that I can't get my body back to a place uh, of strength, flexibility, and resiliency that um, most of us only dream about. Seems like you've done that. So our guest today is Coach Bronson Dant. I would love to hear from Phil. Why? Why this guy? Um, how'd, you, how'd you track him down and, and uh, why is he in the, the honored guest's seat here on the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. Sure thing. Uh, I was really excited to uh, connect with Bronson. Um, I think as much as uh, I am a rebel MD, Bronson is a rebel uh, fitness uh, coach and a rebel in the fitness space. Um, he, uh, he wrote a great book. Uh, it's called The Ultimate Ketogenic Fitness Book. Uh, and uh, certainly excited to get into uh, some of the concepts about that uh, that are in the book. Uh, but before we get to that, um, let's uh, have you kind of introduce yourself a little bit more to our audience, Bronson. Tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what led you to uh, becoming the ultimate ketogenic fitness coach. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you very much. No, Jack, I appreciate you saying that because that's uh, you got the heart of what my message is all about. I definitely want people to understand that there is no better time than now, and there is no reason that now can't be the best time. Um, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what your background is, but um, getting to a point where you can live the quality of life that you want to live is what this whole thing is about. That's what this journey is about. It's not about fat loss. It's not about improving any numbers on a metric or a blood test. It's about living your best life. And that's kind of what all of these discussions really point towards. So I appreciate that. Um, my background is a little bit of everything. I'm ex-military. I was in shape when I was younger. I did the normal get married, have kids, uh, gain 70 pounds thing like a lot of people do. Uh, and then it wasn't until I was almost 40 that I realized that things weren't going the way I wanted them to. Uh, started getting into fitness a few years after that, kind of found uh, my groove when it comes to nutrition in 2018, I started carnivore. Um, and it's pretty much been nonstop since then. Yeah. And certainly a story, uh, that, uh, we we've heard a number of times here, a story that, uh, I share with you as well. Um, let's go back a little bit to your, uh, you know, kind of to the origin story. Um, you're in the military and you're in great shape. And um, if you're like most, uh, that was probably because you were, um, you know, working your butt off and constant activity <laughs> and uh, probably weren't eating uh, very well back then. No. And it's, it's actually interesting to think about what we would eat in the military because they literally work you so much that you're eating thousands of calories a day. I mean, one MRE is what, 3000 calories and you eat two or three of those a day at times. There are times where you're literally eating those things multiple times a day and um, maintaining your weight because you're just working so much. Uh, and that is one of those things that kind of sets you up for failure as you progress in age and get 
get out of the military. You think it's just about working hard and eating less because you used to work hard and eat more and you didn't gain weight. So, well, if I want to lose weight, I just need to eat less. And you don't really realize that there's a lot more to it. And when you're young, the, the margin for error is a little bit larger than when you're in your 40s and 50s and 60s, you know, so uh, you have to, and there's a lot less over damage over time that you're, that you're recovering from. So uh, the damage, I think for me mentally was done early, partially because of my experience in the military. We used to eat our butt off uh, and work our butt off. And that's all I thought I ever needed to do. And what, uh, what, led you you know after the military into the uh fitness space what you, what got you interested in it and then i know uh you kind of had uh, a few different uh business pursuits around uh fitness mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about that journey yeah so in my late 30s um i was having issues i had ibs i had urgent bowels i had a lot of gut problems uh, my life was pretty much controlled by how close i could be to a bathroom so that that story, we could probably talk for an hour wow. just on that lifestyle uh, and what that was doing to me, my quality of life. Um, at the same time, I realized that I was overweight and I was out of shape and the visual of what I looked like and what I represented uh, didn't match the image that I had in my head. So I had an image in my head of I'm this guy. And then I saw a picture. My daughter took a picture of me at the beach and I was like, that is not the guy that I'm thinking I am, right? I got man boobs. I got a gut. I'm look, look like this beach whale sitting in a chair on the side on the beach. Mm -hmm. And that was really kind of the first slap in the face to say, Hey dude, you got to change something. This is not going the direction that you want it to go. So, so I, that, that happened. I started looking in some fitness because I've always been interested more in fitness and I didn't really understand the impact of nutrition. So for me, I did a little bit different than most people. A lot of people look at that and say, well, I need to lose fat or I need to do something to fix my nutrition. I actually went to fitness first and that's where I found CrossFit, fell in love with that, started doing that, became a coach, opened up a CrossFit gym. Uh, and then several years after owning a CrossFit gym, been doing CrossFit for almost 10 years and realized, hey, I put on 30, 40 of those pounds that I had lost initially. Like I looked at another picture of myself. I'm at a pool party with some members of my gym and I'm like, that guy looks just like the guy that was on the beach six, seven years ago. What's going on here? I'm, I'm a CrossFit guy. I'm not supposed to be fat. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then it was shortly after that that I was introduced to carnivore. And the combination of the fitness and getting my nutrition right is really what's gotten me to where I am today. Yeah, and I think we, um, you know, see that a lot. We hear that a lot, um, you know, people's. Uh, first inclination is, you know, it, it, I got to do the exercise more, uh, you know, I got to exercise my way out of this. And, uh, you know, while exercise is certainly uh, helpful, and it's a, you know, it's a part of the equation, um, the, the old adage that you can't out exercise a bad diet, uh, yep. turns out to be very true. Very true. Yeah, exercise you... is not for fat loss. Exactly. And, and that's one of the things you guys looked at my book. One of the big messages I have in there is that if you focus on fat loss, you will always be focused on fat loss for the rest of your life, right? If you focus on fixing your metabolism and enabling your body to function properly, then fat loss will take care of itself. And then all you have to worry about is what am I going to do today? Because you have no limits on what you can do. And that's, that's a much better way to live your life than being freaked out over stressed out over what am I eating? What am I doing? And cutting and restricting and all those other sorts of things. Yeah, very well said. And uh, I think uh, that uh, very closely mirrors, uh, you know, what I talk about in, in uh, Stay Off My Operating Table in my book. And, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, we did, didn't know each other, uh, certainly <laughs> when we wrote our books, but, and we came from sort of different approaches. Uh, but we ended up at the same spot. And that's what, uh, you know, that's what, what we keep seeing over and over again is, uh, you know, so many of us are coming to that same, uh, yes. same uh, spot, that same conclusion around how to improve health. Um, how, how'd you come across carnivore? Um, my ex-wife actually introduced me to the Sean Baker, Joe Rogan podcast. 
many years ago. And I listened to that and then did some research as much as I could find back then in 2018. There really wasn't that much out there. There were a couple blogs. There were a couple, there's like one, maybe two Facebook groups out there. So I, I dug into it for three or four days um, and then just decided, I mean, it can't hurt, right? Number one, I love eating meat. Uh, number two, I've never been a fan of veggies. So it's not like I'm missing out on anything. Um, and I just started May 1st, 2018. I started doing it and I didn't even do anything special. I just, whatever meat we had in the house, I ate that stuff until it was gone and then went out and got more. And that haven't really looked back since. I think it's since then I've probably on average, I do less than 10, 15 grams of carbs a day. And that's just kind of how I live my life now. You, um, you start the book off uh, talking about mindset. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that is certainly a uh, important part of all of this and something that I oftentimes end up, you know, working with my patients on as well. Uh, so, you know, go into that a little bit. What do you, why do you think mindset is so important uh, to start with? And then, you know, how do you uh, coach people in terms yeah. of changing that mindset around health? Yeah, I think mindset is super yeah. important because if you don't have the right mindset, then you're never going to be consistent in what you're doing. So starting off with a goal, what is it that I'm doing, but then understanding why that's important to you. Many times when people come to me and they say, I want to work with you, I say, why do you want to work with me? And it's because I want to lose weight. I'm, I want to lose fat. It, it's that first level thing that everybody says, because that's the, the thing that's easy to respond with. When you dig into it and you really look at the, the, the deep rooted emotional reason that people want to change, it's because they have limitations on their lives and they feel like they can't do things. They feel like there is something missing and they want to be able to enjoy more aspects of their life. Uh, we don't get up in the morning and just go, you know what? I'd like to lose 60 pounds. No, it's a, it's a buildup of uh, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, years, multiple years, decades of things that you've had to say no to or things that you've had to spend extra stress or mind, or mind uh, energy uh, money on medications, doctor's visits, bad relationships, all of the different things that are health impacts in our lives that are not going the way that we would like them to go. And we attribute those things to being heavy, to having too much fat, to being overweight, when really that's just a symptom of something that's going on in our body that we have 100% control over. And helping people understand and getting in the mindset of this isn't something that's happening to me. This is something that is controllable that I can change the direction of is really key. And then understanding what it is emotionally that you're connected to, because challenges are only challenges on our journey because they have emotional responses. So cravings, we don't crave the food. We crave what the food does for us. There's an emotional connection to that food. If my emotional connection to the food that is unhealthy is stronger than my emotional connection to why I don't want to eat that food, then I'll eat that food every time. So your why, the reason why you want to do what you want to do and why you made the decision to improve your health has to have an emotional connection to it. It's got to be something that makes you mad, sad, pissed off, angry, happy, hopeful, something so that when you think about it, you have an emotional, visceral reaction that overcomes whatever that challenge is that you're trying to overcome. I like what I'm hearing, I'm, but I'm trying to come up with examples or samples. I mean, I, I know that, that that emotional component is something that we have to both identify and probably articulate yes. in order to, to harness the power of that emotion to help us to, to, to give us the energy to make the kinds of life changes that we want to make. What I would love for you to do is tell me a story about that illustrates what you're talking about. Sure. 
Um, for me, so I'll tell you about my why. My why yeah, is yeah. my why is never feeling like I could have done something for somebody that I didn't do. My grandparents, both before I got into, I was into fitness. I had a gym. I didn't really have a full comprehension of what fitness was really for. At the time for me, it was about performance. It was about getting in, in the gym and working hard and doing a lot of work and getting in shape. Um, I had not made the connection yet on fitness. It's relationship to nutrition, it's relationship to mindset, and it's relationship to quality of life. It wasn't until after both my grandparents passed away, a few years in between each, where I watched them just completely deteriorate and fall apart. Having to go to my grandmother's deathbed and say goodbye to her while she's laying in a, 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 an old folks home in a bed face down because she couldn't turn over, having to try and talk to her while her head's mashed in a pillow, she can barely talk, holding my hand saying, don't be sad for me and having that conversation because she was literally so weak, she couldn't even sit up and talk. And having to go through that process of the years of just deterioration and lack of ability and just wondering when she was just gonna disappear. I don't ever want to have to go through that again. My parents are in their 60s, almost 70s. Um, I know P I have other people and friends and I don't want, I don't, not only do I not want that for myself, but I don't want that for other people. Nobody should have to go through watching their loved ones fall apart because it doesn't have to happen. So that when, when, what, what, what I do to keep that in my mind is I talk about it. I write about it. I, I, I keep those feelings. You have to remind yourself. So that's one of the, the things I do with people is when I work with them is I have them write that stuff down sit with yourself, go through, I like to do the, the seven levels of why, right? Ask yourself, why is this important? This is important because I, I want to lose weight. Okay. Why do you want to lose weight? Well, I want to lose weight because I don't feel comfortable in my skin when I'm overweight. Okay. Why don't you feel comfortable? In your, and just mm -hmm. work yourself down into something that again, creates an emotional response. And then you've got it on a piece of paper. You can look at it every week. You can look at it every month. Anytime there's a challenge and you're struggling, pull it out of your wallet, whatever it may be, and take a look at that and read that and reconnect with why you're doing what you're doing. So for me, it's, you know, I love working with my mom now. I've been working with my mom as a client for almost nine years. Yeah. So I started working with her when she was 70. She's 69 now, 69, 68, 69. And, you know, her favorite thing to do is deadlift. We talk about exercising all the time. Whoa, She's getting whoa, ready whoa. To... Your mom is 70. Almost. Yep. And deadlifting. Oh, yeah. She, she loves it. Oh man, that is she loves fantastic. It. She that absolutely loves it. She's like, I almost got 150 pounds the other day. Like she's <laughs> she's freaking it's awesome. Yeah, that <laughs> oh, that really wow. is amazing. And the, you know, uh, without giving it all away, the you know, just how you talk about your mom at the beginning of the book was was very inspiring. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and 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 I find that same thing with uh my patients. You know, you have to get to that fourth or fifth level of why mm -hmm. uh before you're really getting into, you know, the the true whys and the true motivation and and the the things that are gonna keep people on the path because yes. Um, you know, if they're just at that first level and it's just, I want to lose some weight, um, you know, that really isn't typically enough to keep people, uh, you know, it sometimes will get them started, but they're oftentimes not going to make it to the finish line just based on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, it's all about emotion. It's got to get you fired up. So, um, mm, I like this. how did you start to, uh, I guess, integrate all of that into, yeah. you know, your coaching. Yeah. So it's actually interesting. Um, it's a really weird kind of chain of events. So I started with the gym. I had the gym for a while. I was really learned. So one of the, the things of all of the fitness certifications and trainings that I've, that I've gone through CrossFit, um, number one, it gets a bad rap because a lot of people don't know what it is. Um, but the premise and the methodology of CrossFit is basically giving yourself exposure to as many things as possible so that your body can function in as many adaptations as, as may be required in life, right? We, we have all sorts of things that happen in life. We have no idea what those stressors are gonna be. So let's train our body to do things in a bunch of different ways. And that's really one of the things that started my awareness that what we're doing in the gym 
has nothing to do with what we do in the gym. I'm not going well, to well, the say gym. that again. What, what we, we do, do in the gym has not just like what we do in the gym has nothing to do with the, what we do in the gym. What we do in the kitchen has nothing to do with what we do. We don't eat just to eat. We eat to fuel our body. We eat to give our body things that we can utilize when we live our life. We work out in the gym so that we can prepare our body in a controlled environment so that we can live in an uncontrolled environment and be safe. Right? Nutrition okay. helps us manage internal physiological or internal biological stresses. Exercise helps us manage external physiological stresses. So exercise and nutrition, when you get the two of those things working together, that's what prepares us for life. And, and, and owning the gym and being exposed to CrossFit was my first introduction to that. The second thing that kind of started bringing stuff together was um, when I got my first in-body body composition scan machine for the gym. And I started incorporating body composition into my program instead of just tracking weight. So when I started looking at body fat percentage, skeletal muscle mass, visceral fat, um, and all of those sorts of numbers, and seeing that there were changes that were happening based on a lot of different factors that weight couldn't tell me. Just looking at weight, okay, you're up, you're down. I have no idea what that means, but being able to look at the components of how a person's body is built, now I have a lot more control and I can start looking at, okay, well, wait, we're looking at building lean mass. Then you start connecting dots. Body, body fat, body composition is a ratio of two things. We always talk about losing body fat. Well, how can we never talk about building muscle? I can lose body fat percentage and never lose a single pound of fat if I build muscle instead. Right? Because it's a ratio. I can manipulate two sides of that equation. And if I'm building muscle as my priority, not only am I increasing my thermogenesis, not only am I increasing my metabolic rate, but I'm also increasing my strength, my physical capability, my reducing my, my risk of injury, improving my immune system, improving my endocrine system. Like everything good happens when you build muscle first. When you focus on fat loss, what do you get? You get fat loss. What's that doing for you? Right? So that's where the second level was. When I started realizing that there was more to it and body composition and fitness. And then I did, after all of this, uh, this is all oh, happening over years. Of course, this is a few years that this is happening. I did a 21-day sugar detox. Now, I was already whole food. I was already pretty much like whole 30 paleo, all natural. I didn't eat a lot of processed things. The only thing that I did was three to four nights a week. I'd come home from work, go work out, come home, eat dinner, sit down, watch TV, and drink a glass of bourbon. Three or four nights a week. I'm a bourbon guy. I love bourbon. I got like 12 bottles of bourbon that I haven't opened in five years. Right. Um, I still I still say I'm a bourbon guy, even though I don't drink anymore. Uh, so I stopped that because I didn't have anything else to stop. I already wasn't doing processed food. I already wasn't doing a lot of sugar. I wasn't doing a lot of carbs. So I said, OK, well, I guess the only other thing to cut out is alcohol. So for 21 days, three weeks, I stopped drinking three to four glasses of bourbon. I lost 10 pounds of body fat in three weeks. Wow. That's off of a body composition scan. That's not even total weight. That's literally my, my skeletal muscle mass, my lean body mass stayed exactly the same. My body fat mass went down 10 pounds just by cutting out alcohol for three weeks. That is where I went, okay, something's going on here. What is this all about? And then I started digging into why did this happen? I started looking at oxidative priority and the, and the role that alcohol plays in subverting processing of other macronutrients and getting into that kind of stuff. And then that got me down the whole, the whole gamut of nutrition things about learning about net carbs versus total carbs and I, how protein isn't really a fuel. That's another thing I get hot on when we talk about calories in, calories out. Stop counting, stop counting total calories because 60% of them don't count. You know, so just getting into all that, I just it just opened up a whole bunch of things. And that's kind of what's led me to where I am now. Okay. I got to ask you about that. 60% of them don't count. <laughs> yeah. So that's that. So if you think about this and I like to, you know, you said this, uh, Dr. Vedia, that I'm kind of the rebel fitness guy. Um, I don't look at calories. I look at 
nutrition, similar to the way we look at taking care of a car. Okay, if we look at the nutrition of a car, let's talk about the fluids in a vehicle. We don't go to the mechanic and say, I have $200, could you give me 30% gas, 40% oil, and 30% transmission fluid, right? We go mm -hmm. in and we tell the mechanic to fill up the fluids based on what the car needs. It's the same with our bodies. Why are we doing things off of calories that number one, we can't track, they don't mean anything. And number two, we're doing it off a percentage that is absolutely arbitrary. Who, how do you know if your body needs 20% of something or 30% of something? And then is that 20% of 1,500 calories or 20% of 4,000 calories? And then how does that compare to the other two macronutrients you know, when I'm putting those in my body? So it, it's, it's so much... Um, the level of convolutedness, if that's even a word, <laughs> that we go through word. to make this stuff work. And it explains why no, it's never worked. It explains why when people calories in, calories out, it, it's an up and down. It doesn't work. You have to get lean to get, uh, you have to get weak to get lean. You have to get fat to get strong. You, all of these things. It's so confusing. So what I do to sum that all up, that was just a little bit of a rant. To sum that all up, I like to break things up into two different things. So when we talk about that 60%, basically protein, we know this is, we know this, right? Protein is not our body's primary source of fuel. Our body doesn't want to, it's the last thing our body wants to use. We'll use, we'll break down amino acids and use those for fuel in the absence of glycogen, in the absence of fatty acids. Okay. So why are we counting calories from protein in our total caloric intake? If it's about fuel burn. Right. Not to mention, if we even get into the thermic effect of food, there's another 35 percent of energy that's expended just to process that. So it's the highest, it's the most expensive macronutrient we have to process. So it calories aren't one to one. There's a large percentage of your caloric intake. If you're counting protein, that doesn't matter at all. So if you if you've read any of Dr. Naaman, Ted Naaman stuff, the PE diet. Uh, protein energy ratio. That's where um, he's influenced a lot of the stuff that I did, that I've done and the way that I work with people. Um, he was kind of like a validation of these thought processes I've been having in my mind for years. And then he came out with the book and I was like, okay, I'm not crazy. There is something to this whole thing. Um, but basically I break it down into functional calories and fuel calories. And I don't even like using calories. I, it should be nutrients, right? Fuel nutrients and functional nutrients because Protein is utilized for muscle protein synth synthesis, cellular repair, immune function, hormone function, um, all of those things. Recovery, it's, it's used for building and maintaining our body. It's not used for fuel. Fat and carbs are used for fuel. They are the fuel that makes our body produce ATP to activate the muscles that protein is building. They're not used for the same thing. So, oh, man, I wish we had a whiteboard going here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. I think I'm tracking with you, yeah. but there are two, um, th basically there are two different pathways. Only one of them affects body fat. The other one affects lean mass. So uh, if we talk, like we it, go back to that ratio of body fat percentage, we talk about body composition. If you want to control your body composition and focus on building muscle, focus on protein and the things that you're going to do to build muscle. If you want to lose body fat or gain body fat, focus on fat and carbs. They're separate. If you yeah, want I think to, that, go ahead, Phil. I was going to say, I think that's a, you know, a, a good way to be looking at this and um, mm -hmm. it can help to clear up a lot of the confusion that people oftentimes get into. You know, when you look around our kind of standard nutritional advice, um, it almost seems that it's uh, intentionally trying to confuse people. Uh, right. So they just sort of give up and say, okay, well, I'll just eat whatever's around me because I, I can't figure it out and it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you think, if you think about the idea that, you know, I've, I've heard, I was listening to Casey's podcast from a, few, a couple months ago yeah. and just listening to other people and Jen, anybody who knows about calories in calories out, when you cut your calories and you go into a deficit to lose body fat, because we're looking at 
one thing, what always happens? Your BMR goes down, you lose, you lose weight, which means you're losing body fat and you're losing lean mass. So you are essentially reducing the, uh, the efficiency of your body's performance because you're starving yourself. It's like, it's like I'm building a house and I've got all my workers working, but I've said, you know what? Today you're getting half the wood, half the bricks, half the cabling, half the paint, and you still got to finish the house. It's not going to work. Right. The house is never going to get finished. So when we split those apart, because protein, okay, here's the, here's the other one. Lean mass drives metabolism. And lean mass is the, the, the portion of your body composition that is, that is muscle, correct? Yeah. So there's, you, you can split it up into a few different ways. Lean mass is pretty much anything that's not fat. So that includes water, bone, skin, muscle, everything else. Anything um, that's when, not fat. Okay. Anything that's All not right. fat. Yeah. So lean mass, usually when most people say lean mass, they're talking in general about muscle. So if you want to be specific, then you would say skeletal muscle mass. And, and that's really what I'm talking about. Skeletal muscle drives metabolism. The more muscle you have, the better your metabolic rate. So I'll just use myself as an example. In a traditional calories in, calories out model, when you go in a deficit to lose fat, your BMR goes down. Your base metabolic rate goes down. Because, not because you're losing weight, because you're losing lean mass. Okay, so I'm doing an experiment right uh, now. Uh, hold on, hold I'm... on, hold on. Let me, let me make sure I'm clear. So when you're in a caloric, when you're in a state of caloric deficit, your base metabolic rate goes down. And, that, and what that means is that the efficiency with which your body makes use of the fuel that you feed it. Is that correct? The nutrition, the nutrients, fuel, protein, anything. That's basically how well your body is functioning decreases. And is that, is that a, a, what you how well your body is functioning? I want you to define that. That means effectively using your fuel or, yes. or. Yeah. So okay. let's, let's replace fuel with nutrients because effectively using your nutrients, if you're in okay. a caloric deficit for too long, what happens? You start losing your hair, you start getting temperature dysregulation, you start getting hormone dysregulation, all these other things start happening, right? Because your metabolism is broken. Okay. So okay. here's right. so what the way that I look at it is if I'm going to, if lean mass or muscle drives my metabolism, then why wouldn't I always want my lean mass to be in its optimal state? So mm -hmm. give yourself as much protein as you can handle and do everything you can to maintain or improve your lean mass. So what I'm doing right now, I'm doing an experiment. I'm three months in. Okay. Following my methodology and I'm documenting as, it, as I go, you can see all my stuff on YouTube. Um, I have gained three pounds of muscle. I've increased my BMR almost hundred calories. Okay. And I've maintained the exact same body fat mass as I had three months ago. So I've actually your, lost your BMR weight. is, has increased at the same time that you've added muscle mass. Correct. Well, in fact, I'm guessing that the increase in the BMR is a, is a direct function of the additional muscle mass. Exactly. But I've lost okay. overall weight. And, but, and you've lost weight, yep. which implies that the BMR would go down. Traditional weight loss under the normal calories in calories out model. If your weight goes down, your BMR goes down oh. because I've separated your lean mass and protein from your fuel. I can manipulate body composition while improving base metabolic function. Okay. So is this, is this strictly a result of resistance training? It starts with the nutrition, but the resistance training is absolutely part of it. There's got to be resistance training. There's got to be adequate sleep and recovery. Uh, there's a couple other factors that go into building muscle, um, but it starts with the nutrition. Okay. So I'm thinking, uh, who is the, who's the guy that's sitting and listening to this podcast and is what what are the questions that he's asking and the feelings that he's having about do I want to work with Coach Bronson Dand? So sure. my guess is he's he's thinking number one, um, I don't like the way my 
my pants fit around my waist mm -hmm. they're tight mm -hmm. i'm i'm fluffier than i know i want to be um maybe my sleep is disrupted yeah, all of it. Uh, um I ache in the morning when I wake up. I'm tired of that. I want to play with my kids. I can't Absolutely. get down on the ground and roll around without feeling like I'm 190 years old. Yeah, I, I, I want to, yeah, I want to go into my yard and do yard work. I want to go shopping and be able to carry the bags myself. Like I want to be able to walk up and down the stairs without feeling like I had to stop halfway. It could be all sorts of things. Like I deal with people in all the different ranges. Um, in fact, most of my clientele, I'm probably about 80% women over 40 is most of my clientele. So I'm talking about muscle and everything else. Um, you'd be surprised. I mean, you might not be surprised at the percentage of women who don't get enough protein and the percentage of women who don't have enough lean mass or muscle on their body. It's a huge focus. It's a, and, and that's, you kind of see that with the experience I've had with my mom and the passion I have for making sure that she's at a, a good place as she gets older. Um, but it's, it's, it is absolutely imperative that women start eating more protein, that women start doing resistance training and start give, giving themselves the freedom to do that for themselves and for their own quality of life. Yeah, I think certainly, you know, the the uh, science uh, bears that out and we see, you know, the effects of, uh, you know, for women when they go through menopause and, you know, the amount of muscle mass loss that typically uh, occurs with that is, uh, is really devastating towards it's, health. It's huge. Yeah. Yep. I, I actually, so we actually did, I have a, a white paper that I can make available to you guys. Um, I'm trying right now to actually get it published in a journal. That's a whole process I've never done before. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, we did an eight week study with 30 women all over 40 peri and postmenopausal, um, following my nutrition protocol, using my fitness protocol, for eight weeks and then just documented the whole process. So um, they all had body composition improvements. Every single physical performance benchmark that we tested improved over the eight weeks. They got stronger, they got faster, they improved their lean mass, they reduced their body fat. Um, and then the non-scale, the non-metrics, you know, the responses and the feedback from every single one of them on the quality of life stuff that we talked about was improved. Less hot flashes, better sleep, uh, more, you know, more, more satisfaction from their food, all sorts of things. So there's a lot of things that go into the struggle that people have. The, the, the benefits of doing things differently when it comes to nutrition are more than just the body composition. So when we talk about prioritizing protein to build lean mass, to maintain our metabolic function, we're also talking about nutrient density. Sources of protein are more nutrient than anything else. We're talking right. about sources of protein being more satiating than anything else. So we know you're going to be hungry for longer. You're not going to be as snacky or cravy. We know that the bioavailability of nutrients from protein sources are better. So you're going to get more actual usable nutrition from the protein sources. So there's a lot of benefit to focusing on protein, not just from what it does physiologically, but what it does biologically and what it does mentally, because it takes care of the things like cravings and being hungry. Like I've never had a client tell me as they're losing body fat, tell me that they're hangry or that they feel like they don't eat enough because I basically tell them to stuff their face, just do it with meat. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, <laughs> oh, wow. I, I oftentimes use that example. I said, no, no, no one gorges on steak. And, right. uh, you know, we, we eat until we're full. And, you know, when you're eating the whole real foods and especially the animal uh, products, you know, your, your body can tell you uh, when enough is enough. And, and the, the sad reality, you know, is that for most people, um, you know, they can't get enough protein you know we we are such a new a protein um depleted uh or protein restricted yep. uh uh you know nutritional approach in our society that um it, the answer is almost always eat more protein uh, pretty much I, i've never had I have yet to tell someone they're eating too much protein. So yeah, exactly, exactly. Let's talk about the uh, fitness uh, part of it uh, a yeah. little bit. You know, in terms of uh, uh, exercise and and uh, what what do you recommend? You know, there's always the big question about you know 
should I be doing all my cardio or, or how should I spend my time, you know, when I'm focusing on fitness? Yeah. The, I see this question on social media all the time. If you only had 20 minutes, what would you do? And it's, it's so all over the place. Uh, the way I look at it is if your goal, which my, my recommendation is that your goal should always be choose the thing that's going to improve your metabolic function, not replace or supplement that. So cardio simulates good metabolic function while you're doing it, but it doesn't help long-term metabolic function, right? The better you get at cardio, the more efficient. So the less you actually burn, if you're looking at it from a calorie perspective, you get efficient at it. So you burn less. So you have to do more. So it's a diminishing return that eventually becomes a net negative because you got to do it so much in order to keep your fat loss. If you focus on building muscle, if you only have 20 minutes, I want you to do something where you're moving your body against some kind of resistance, even if that resistance is body weight. Do something that's going to move as many muscles and activate as many total muscle fibers in your body as possible. Um, the thing in general about fitness that I want people to understand is one, we talked about this before, you can start at any time. It doesn't take a lot doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. If you have any experience or not, there's always something that you can do. And then the second thing is it doesn't take a lot, 1% more, one little thing more. If your biggest struggle in life right now is walking up the stairs, then the exercise for you is to walk up the stairs as many times a day as possible. That's all you got to do. Pick the thing that is physically challenging for you and work on making that thing easy hmm. that's, a, that's all that's you, a you don't really have to join the cool uh, shift of of perspective mm -hmm. pick the thing that is difficult for you on a regular basis yep. and work on making it easy absolutely because if it's difficult for you now then that means one thing it means it is a physical limitation that is currently affecting your quality of life Sure. And the sense. goal is to improve quality of life. You don't have to go to the gym for that. You don't have to yeah, pay yeah. thousands of dollars for a personal trainer. If getting on the floor, getting up and down on the floor is challenging and you have a hard time doing that to play huh. with your grandkids, start doing it more. <laughs> don't avoid burpees. the things that are difficult. <laughs> Figure out a way to make it work. Oh my goodness. Oh. Yeah. Up and down. Oh. I think that's great. Uh, great advice in general, you know, is, is, you know, do difficult things sometimes and then figure out how to make them easier. And that's yeah. going to really uh, get you far in life. Absolutely. So uh, I guess it seems you, blindingly obvious, but for some reason, it's never really occurred to me. <laughs> yeah, no, well, because we get so caught up in, in the struggle that sometimes we forget that you know, we need to be reminded that we have power. We have power. You can take control of the situation. And once you know, once you acknowledge, wait a second, I can do something about this. And it doesn't take a lot. Here's the, here's the cool thing about mm -hmm. beginners. If you're stuck, if you've never done anything before, or it's been years since you've done anything, it's called the beginner gains, right? We call it in, yeah. in, the, in the fitness industry. The, you don't have to do a lot as a beginner to see a huge in, improvement see a huge impact, right? I've been working out for 12, 15 years. The things that I want to change, I really have to focus on and spend a lot of deliberate focused time to see improvements and things. Right. But if you're just getting started and your biggest thing is walking up and down the stairs, you walk up and down the stairs a couple extra times every day for a week. And you're going to be like, holy cow, my whole life has changed. Because it doesn't take a lot. I love that. Okay, so one of the questions I've I wanted to ask you mm -hmm. as a coach, um, I assume that you hear the same sets of complaints and or excuses over and over again. Yeah. So what I'd love to hear is, you know, the top three or four or five complaints or excuses and and how you move your clients past that sure this is real this is an easy one actually 
it doesn't matter what the excuse is. The reframe of your excuse becomes a reason why you should do this thing. Give me an example. I'm too old. I'm too old. I can't do that. Well, that's why you need to do it. I don't have the time to fit this in. Well, that's why you need to start making the time and make it a priority so that you can get better at time management and improve your ability to manage your day. Oh, well, if I do that, then I won't be able to spend time with my kids. Get your kids involved. Set an example for your kids so that they know how important health and fitness is for them. Every single excuse that you have is actually a reason why you need to be doing it. Every excuse you have for not doing it is a reason why you need to be doing it. Exactly. I like that. I like that. Okay. Um, oh, wow. You know, this is very, it, it's, it's just timely for me because I, this face plant I did a week ago, mm, I, yeah. it's just made me, um, ugh, it's just maddening, you know, for your body to go. To right. Yeah. Turn when you feel off. like you're out of control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it was a lack of fitness that led to my blackout, but I feel like I was in a car wreck. Mm. My, my, my back is all torqued up and my muscles are all messed up and, mm -hmm. and I can't help but think if, if my fitness level was better, sure. I wouldn't be so damn sore well, from taking a fall, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, would it have prevented the fall? No, I don't think so. But, but I don't know that I'd be feeling like I'm, I've been run through the spin cycle of the washing machine. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, one of the things about muscle, muscle in general, we look at the numbers, you know, the more, more muscle or more lean mass is correlated with shorter hospital stays. The, the more psych or sarcopenic a patient is, the longer they tend to stay in the hospital. So, you know, in, in, in sarcopenic the idea, means uh, low muscle mass, low muscle mass. Okay. Yeah. So, so the idea that having more muscle is going to help you be more survivable is an absolute real reality. Yeah, certainly we see that um, over and over again, you know, in, in the medical literature, in the scientific studies, um, you know, and uh, whatever population you want to look at, you know, we've demonstrated it in, in people who have heart attacks. Uh, the more muscle you have, uh, the better the outcome is going to be. Yep. Wow. Okay. So, um Thing number one, you've got, I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm working through this mental list that I'm having built inside my brain. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, thing number one, what is your excuse? Okay. That's the reason what your, your excuse for not doing it. That's the reason to do it. Yep. Um, what stupid, I probably shouldn't be that, that inflammatory with my words. What, <laughs> what excuses do, are you making to yourself? Um, or what silly stories are you telling yourself about eating that are just simply wrong and, and, and keep you from making the kinds of successful gains that you want? Yeah. Now, the, 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 one of the things I'm hearing is um, focus on muscle building. And with the focus being building muscle, that will inform how you make choices about eating. Am, yes. am I am I am I right? So yeah, yeah. all right. So protein let, builds yeah, let muscle. Me, yeah, let me give you. I'll give you my three the three tenets of nutrition. Yeah, nutrient density, bioavailability, satiety. And satiety just mean it, it makes you it makes you feel full makes you feel full for okay. longer. So there's a difference between feeling full and then being hungry 20 minutes later Yeah, and feeling satisfied for four hours. That's satiety, right? Yeah. So, you know, I've heard Phil talk about 
stand at an operating table for hours on end, having not eaten all day long, finish up doing something that is both physically and mentally and emotionally wildly taxing. And since he became, since he started eating primarily carnivore, he finishes that up and and sometimes isn't even hungry, which yeah. is to me, it was like, mind <laughs> just mind. I can't sit and write for three or four hours yeah. without, without getting really, really hungry. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> the, yeah. We can talk about the mental clarity aspect of it, but I'm at a point now where I, I I'll do that. I'll, I'll sit, I'll get up in the morning, get something to drink. And then it'll be like, Oh crap, it's one o'clock. I need to eat, you know, and just, it just the 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 sometimes I have to remind myself that I need to eat something because if I don't, then by the time I am ready to eat, then I've got to eat so much to get what they, I needed. Yeah, it's probably not going to finish it. So right. that's a whole nother that's a whole nother discussion. But but yeah, so yeah. if you focus on nutrient density, bioavailability, and satiety, number one, you're going to folk make decisions that give your body the most nutrition possible. And it's probably going to be meat. <laughs> Just put that out there. I, I've, I've told my wife, um, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma. I grew up in cattle country. And mm-hmm. I can, you know, my, my memories of being a kid are, are we just always had fresh beef. Yeah. And, and I don't know whether I feel good when I eat beef simply because it's kind of, uh, you know, it takes me back to being a kid and I have warm feelings about it. Or if my body just literally prefers beef. Why does it matter if you feel good? Well, it it, it doesn't matter. I, I, (laughs) but I've reached the point in life where I'm just like, you know, my my answer all the time, you know, what, if you could eat anything in the world, my answer is always beef, bring me beef. Sure. Um, all right. So, you know, it's funny, Phil, this is, we've been hearing basically the same message over and over and over, but I'm hearing something here that has kind of reframed my understanding. Yeah. I think Bronson has a unique, uh, unique way of looking at all this that really, uh, you know, brings it together. Well, yeah, I, I I really, I really, so I'm, I have a background in IT. I got 20 years in IT project management, doing a bunch of engineering stuff, stuff like that. And one of the things that I developed in that career was taking really technical stuff and trying to make it understandable by people sitting at the computer actually doing the work. Yeah. Um, and I think I think that's served me well in this space because I like getting into how all this stuff works. Um, but then I also want to be able to explain it to people that I'm trying to help in such a way that they go, oh, that makes sense. Um, and I, I think when you when you boil it all down, when you boil everything that everybody talks about, and this is why I really wish there was a way that I could just wave a wand and get people to stop talking about calories, and stop talking about fat loss, stop talking about this th- that whole side of things, um, because it's not about fat loss. It's about quality of life. And when you reframe everything and look at what can I do to make my life better, it changes the entire paradigm of how we look at health and fitness. I think that's I'm a great, you. great way to sum it up and uh, a great uh, way we should all be looking at this. So for everyone out there who is saying, I got to work with this guy, tell us a little bit more about how people find you. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram at uh, coach underscore Bronson underscore keto. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, ultimate ketogenic fitness on YouTube. Uh, my website is ultimate ketogenic fitness.com. I do a bunch of things. I have one-on-one coaching, but what I'm really pushing right now is I've actually um, partnered with in body. So the guys that make that body composition scanner that I think is the best out there on the market. Um, and we do a 10 week nutrition and fitness body composition challenge. So we run those every three months. Uh, and I think our next one's coming up in October. Uh, and we try to bring people in it, right. It's a group thing. Everybody can sign up. We get 15, 20, 30, 50, hundred people. It doesn't make a difference. Um, and we try to just walk you through, uh, what the process is understanding my methods and protocols, trying to help figure out how to make, uh, nutrition and fitness work for your specific issues in life. So it's a group thing, but I don't, 
give meal plans. I don't give specific programming, right? I have guidelines and, and workouts that can be followed, but it's about meeting everybody where they are. So if you're not used to eating a lot of protein and you feel like I have to have my veggies, we'll figure out a plan that's going to fit you, but also help you move forward. If you've never worked out before, you don't even have a gym or equipment, we'll figure out some body weight exercises and get you doing something that's going to help you move forward. So that 1% more is all we're looking for. And that's what those challenges are really about. 1% more. All right. Well, I, I will remind our listeners, as always, uh, all the contact information for Coach Bronson Dant will be available in the show notes uh, on the podcast. Um, so I'm, I, I've got to tell you, this is I don't know why my brain is just spinning. This is good. I think I, I think that this question is bubbling to the surface you talked about cardio mm -hmm. and and there's a there's something inside me that goes yeah yeah that makes sense um so let me ex let me see if i can can articulate the the question and sure. ask you to expand on it so the problem with the problem try the wrong word the the um the promise that being that that heavy duty cardio has been that we've been given over the last the several decades about going mm -hmm. all the way back to Kenneth Cooper mm -hmm. um, is that that's, that's the path to fitness. But yeah. what I hear you saying is that when you're engaging in hardcore cardio, orange theory kind of stuff or rowing or running on the treadmill, you're simulating through heavy cardio activity, increased heart rate, what a metabolically healthy body would do sitting in a chair. Yep. That's a good way. That's a good way to put it. Another way to put it is cardio only works while you're doing it. Cardio only works while you're doing it. And you know, and I've heard that before, but I've never heard anybody put it the way you put it. Mm -hmm. That, that, that cardio, that, that doing the cardio activities simulates metabolic health yeah. without actually being a super fat dude could simulate metabolic health for the 15 minutes he's on the, on the, on the treadmill. Yep. But the instant he stops and his heart rate comes down, he's back to. Sure. And, and, it's, metabolic and the, thing, the, the thing that's even worse about that is it's simulating metabolic function and it's not even a uh, doing anything to, in fact, in some ways, it's actually a detriment to physical function, right? There's no range of motion work being done. There's no balance, coordination, agility. There's no, no strength. There's none of, none of those aspects of fitness that go into the full definition of what it means to be healthy are being applied when you just do cardio. Wow. <laughs> this is fantastic. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to show here Bronson's <laughs> book, the ultimate ketogenic fitness book. Um, I got started on it, but uh, this mess kept yeah, me yeah, from, yeah. from finishing it. I'm going to finish it. Um, if you like what you're hearing here, um, follow the various links that we're going to provide to get a hold of Coach Bronson Dant, his his challenges, his book. Um, I know I can hardly wait to sit down and kind of absorb this. Um, I think I'm more motivated than I was two weeks ago. <laughs> yes. Good. My job is done. <laughs> Phil, man, you just keep doing it, man. You keep knocking it out of the park with these people. All right. Um, I, I feel like we could go on for a while, but we're, we're at over an hour right now. Um, I want to thank you. No, I'm, I really appreciate it. You guys have me on. It means a lot. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, to learning more and hearing more. All right, well, let's call it a, call it a show. It's been a good one. Um, I I have a suspicion I'm going to read this book and then and then send you an email. Hey, Bronson, remember me? I got questions. <laughs> All right, well, for uh, Coach Bronson Dant, the ultimate ketogenic fitness guru. Um, I'm Jack Heal. This is the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast uh, with your host, Dr. Philip Ovedia. 
I would recommend that you go to Phil's website, ifixhearts.co, and take his metabolic fitness quiz. You can kind of get a quick look at where you are uh, just on that website. You can also follow him on Twitter, which is a great way to keep track of him at ifixhearts and uh, his website. If you would like to have a little bit more detailed help with maintaining your own health and that of uh, your corporate business culture is olivadiaheartheath.com, just like it says on his on his shirt there. Phil, any last words before we uh, call it a day? I don't know what happened, but I just literally don't. I'm not hearing you at all. Mm-mm. You don't appear. Another great to, uh, Oh, there we podcast. go. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we'll have Bronson back on sometime. All right. Well, pleasure. Thank you. I've I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. All right. Well, uh, this has been the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast, and we will talk to you guys next time. America is fat and sick and tired. 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy and at risk of a sudden heart attack. Are you one of them? Go to ifixhearts.co and take Dr. Ovedia's metabolic health quiz. Learn specific steps you can take to reclaim your health, reduce your risk of heart attack, and stay off Dr. Ovedia's operating table.